Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Haas and this is the National Paralegal College Faculty's Legal Analysis of the News. Today is March 4th of the year 2016 and the case that I want to discuss is a very interesting case before the United States Supreme Court right now. Oral arguments on this case happened just a couple of days ago. And the question in this case is abortion access. An abortion access issue is based on a Texas law, which did a whole bunch of things. One of the things it did is re it required uh, abortion clinics to have certain hospital-like facilities. It, it put all sorts of additional requirements on abortion clinics in order to operate. There are also Texas statutes on the book that require sonograms before an abortion and various other restrictions on the right to an abortion. And what I want to discuss today is what is this case about and what question will this case turn on? Right now, there are eight justices on the United States Supreme Court and since the death of Justice Scalia a couple of weeks ago, four of them are on the quote-unquote liberal block of the U.S. Supreme Court. That, those are Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, Ginsburg and Breyer. Then you've got four justices. Well, Justice Kennedy is considered kind of a centrist, and then you have Justice Alito, Justice Roberts, and Justice Clarence Thomas. The thing that this case will turn on is will the four quote unquote, again I keep saying that, liberal justices will almost certainly vote to strike down the Texas regulation. So the question really is can they poach one more? Can a justice like Justice Kennedy become the fifth justice that votes to strike down the Texas regulation? The lower court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, voted to uphold the Texas regulation. And that means that if it is a 4-4 tie, the judgment of the Court of Appeals stands and the Texas regulation will not be struck down. So the whole question is, Will one more justice, probably Justice Kennedy, but you never know, vote to strike down the Texas legislation that limits the right to have abortion in some cases? And as you can see from the text of this article from the New York Times, the court appeared splintered on Wednesday, when of course this is going to be a split decision one way or the other. The court's four liberal justices were adamant that these restrictions imposed by the Texas law on abortion providers serve no medical purpose and would be struck down because they couldn't pass constitutional muster. Two of the more conservative justices said that there's little evidence that they had closed, that any clinics had closed, or would close because of the law. As we'll see, that will be a key issue. Does this impose a substantial restriction or an undue burden on the right to abortion? If so, the law can be struck down. Otherwise, it won't be. And that's why some of the justices asked questions that would bear on that question. For example, would the remaining Texas clinics, whatever their number, have the capacity to handle the 65 to 70,000 abortions performed annually in the state in recent years? In other words, if some clinics have to be closed down because their hallways are too narrow or because of for, for whatever other technical reason the state law would require them to shut down because they don't meet certain requirements, would that cause there to be fewer abortions, in other words, would that restrict the ability of people to get abortions, or would the other clinics in the state be able to handle it? That, of course, is a very important question, because it, makes it, it helps to make a determination as to whether this restriction is an undue burden, is a substantial burden, on the right to I found this blog from the Wall Street Journal about some of the questions, somebody who was in there uh, watching the oral argument, some of the questions that the justices had. Justice Kennedy asked whether they had strong and tangible evidence to support the claim that the state was imposing real burdens on women seeking abortion. Obviously, Justice Kennedy, who might very well be the swing vote in this case, uh, the idea that the four liberal justices, Breyer, Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Kagan, will almost certainly vote to strike down the Texas, uh, Texas statute. Alito and Thomas will almost certainly vote to uphold the Texas statute. Roberts mm, probably vo will vote to uphold the Texas statute, so it really comes down to Justice Anthony Kennedy, and that's why people are looking very carefully at the kinds of questions that Justice Kennedy asks. In fact, Justice Kennedy even suggested sending it back down to the lower courts for more fact-finding. Fact-finding is an important aspect of this case because a finding of fact that this is going to decrease the availability of abortion statewide is the sort of thing that might factor into the question of whether it's a substantial burden on the right to abortion. Now, Justice Kennedy also mentioned one more thing that, according to this blog, is worrisome for the state of Texas, and that is Justice Kennedy asked, or implied at least, that the court must weigh the state's interest behind the requirement. 
against the impact on women who want abortions. In other words, the question here is a very interesting and novel question that Justice Kennedy was brought up, was was bringing up, and that is when you're looking at the right to abortion, you're looking at the undue burden that cannot be assessed against women who want to get an abortion. Do you look at the state's interest? Do you just look at whether it's going to be a major burden? Or do you also look at how strong the state's interests are here? The state has argued, with support from another justice, Justice Roberts, that the undue burden test only weighs access to abortion without regards to the state's reasons for regulation. If Justice Kennedy thinks that there ought to be a balancing test, if Justice Kennedy thinks that, well, we have to look at the interests of the state versus the interest of the mother, then that would make it a lot easier for him to vote to strike down the regulation. I saw from the same source that the liberal judges are harping on this idea, the state's interest in these regulations. And that's part, part and parcel of that it are the state's reasons for this regulations, do, this regulation. Does the state have a good enough reason to limit abortion facilities based on this idea? Justice Kagan asked, why would Texas do this? Now, the Mr. Keller, the attorney for the state, replied that it was motivated by an individual case, the case of uh, Kermit Gosnell, a Philadelphia abortion doctor. We may remember him from the news. There were all sorts of horrible images that came out of his, well, practice, I guess you'd call it. But Justice Ginsburg thinks that that's not a good enough reason. He thinks that, well, there was one filthy clinic that hadn't been inspected for 15 years. That is not a good enough reason for Texas to say, okay, well, therefore, you have to double the size of the hallways in every single abortion clinic statewide. Justice Breyer, in fact, made two points to this regard. He said, first of all, you're tr what you're trying to do is cure a problem that there's no real instance across the nation. This idea that you're going that the hallway needs to be a certain width and that certain other requirements those those are solutions to things that really haven't been proven to be problems and also justice Breyer points out that the risk of a colonoscopy is 28 times that of an abortion and yet Texas doesn't have similar provisions to protect colonoscopy patients all of this discussion is based on the idea that the state doesn't have a good enough reason to limit the ability for an abortion in these types of cases by essentially, in essence, shutting down these clinics. So what we need to do now is go back over the history of this limitation of these statutes that limit abortions and determine how we think it might play out in this case. Although, of course, there's no good way to predict it. Well, the grandfather case, so to speak, that this entire issue is being brought up under is Casey, Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania versus Casey. Of course, Roe versus Wade first established the right to abortion back in 1973. Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania versus Casey was a case that reaffirmed the right to abortion in Roe versus Wade, but also discussed this idea of the undue burden. Justice Kennedy himself was on the court back in 1992 when he decided according to this article, changing his mind at the last minute to uphold and reaffirm Roe v. Wade. There was a chance at that time that Roe v. Wade was going to be struck down completely, and of course that didn't happen. And the article notes, of course, that if he, decides, if he sides with conservative justices in this case, it'll be a 4-4 decision, and that means the closures of the abortion clinics will be upheld. The Casey case, first and foremost, upheld the quote-unquote essential holding of Roe versus Wade, that language itself is quite controversial, by saying that a state, pre it actually determined that a distinction between pre-viability and post-viability, pre-viability outside the womb, a state cannot place an undue burden on the right to an abortion. Post-viability, the state can prohibit abortions completely, except in cases where the life or health of the mother is threatened, and many states do so to this day. But the point is pre-viability. The Casey case said that a court cannot, a law, excuse me, cannot place substantial obstacles in the path of women seeking an abortion before viability. The Casey case was about a Pennsylvania statute that had placed a whole bunch of restrictions on abortion. There were five abortion limitations that were challenged in Casey. Pennsylvania statute had required informed consent. It said the doctor had to provide her with specific information at least 24 hours before the procedure was to take place, including how, inform how it could be detrimental to her health. There was also a 24-hour waiting period, which is, I guess, the same thing, because the informed consent has to be 20 24 hours before the abortion, so obviously that implies a 24-hour waiting period. There was also a spousal notification requirement, 
it said that a woman seeking abortion had to get a statement that she had notified her husband, a parental consent requirement for a minor, and a certain reporting requirements that were imposed on facilities. These were challenged by proponents of abortion, essentially saying that these are too limiting, these, are too, these interfere too much with a woman's right to get an abortion. Well, the court in Casey kind of had a mixed decision in this case, and it said, whereas there is a right to abortion, something the state can regulate it to some extent. For example, a 24-hour waiting period, upheld. Licensing requirement for performing physician was also upheld. Fully informed consent requirement, being notified of these other issues, also upheld. Parental consent requirement was upheld, but only if there is a judicial bypass. In other words, if there's an emergency, the girl, I guess, has to be able to go to court and get a judge to waive the parental consent requirement. Spousal notification requirement was struck down. The court said that is too much of a burden, and of course prohibition would also be a burden. So in essence, what the Casey court said is, as, I, as this cartoon so uh, eloquently puts it, yes, you have the right to an abortion, abortion but first you have to jump through a few hoops. Uh, spousal notice was actually struck down, so this is maybe not the best cartoon in the world, but there is a 24-hour waiting period, a parental consent for a minor, uh, with a judicial, judicial bypass, informed, fully informed consent requirements, etc. So now we have a standard, and the standard is undue burden. A state or the federal government cannot place an undue burden on women before they get an abortion pre-viability. How have courts treated this undue burden from then, 1992, 24 years ago, until now? Well, I haven't gotten time, obviously, to go through every single abortion case between now and then, but I am going to go through a few of them that I think might be at least somewhat relevant to our case. The first one I want to discuss is a case called Gonzalez v. Carhart. There was a federal act passed in the year 2003 called the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act, and it banned the procedure, not in all cases, but in most cases, it banned a, the procedure called partial, partial birth abortion. You can Google it if you're not, if you're not familiar with what, what that is. But the, and the court upheld it. Actually, earlier there was another case called Stenberg v. Carhart, where the court had struck down a Nebraska statute that had banned partial birth abortions. Now, the court in Gonzales did distinguish it and said, well, the Nevada statute was too vague, the federal statute was better, although most people will tell you that the courts have simply changed its mind. But anyway, the court did allow the federal government to ban partial birth abortions, even pre-viability. So a partial birth abortion ban was not considered an undue burden. I guess the theory being that there were other methods, especially pre-viability, there are other methods to carry out an abortion, and therefore the fact that we're banning, banning partial birth abortion is not in and of itself an undue influence. Another rule, and this isn't a U.S. Supreme Court case, this is a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals case, was the two-trip rule. Indiana had a rule that was similar to the Pennsylvania rule in Casey, but it was even a little bit more restrictive. It, first of all, required 18 hours before the abortion in the presence of the pregnant woman. So not only did you need a 24-hour waiting period, you actually had to go to the doctor twice. You had to sit down with the abortion doctor at least twice. And the doctor who was going to perform the abortion had to make all sorts of disclosures. The nature, nature of the procedure, the risks and alternatives or treatment, the probable age of the fetus at this point, uh, and offered offer to provide a picture or drawings, dimensions of the fetus, relevant information about potential, potential survival of an unborn fetus, uh, the medical risks associated. Basically, there was this fully informed consent requirement, which required the doctor to uh, sit down with the, with the patient and at least 18 hours before the procedure and give her all this information. And that was upheld as well by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, again, as not being an undue burden. Okay, and that brings us to our next issue, and that is whether we examine the purpose of the rule in the first place. Here we have another U.S. Supreme Court case, a Masarek versus Armstrong, which was based on a Montana statute that even the plaintiffs admitted didn't really place that much of a burden on the right to abortion. However, what they argued is that I think there was this was a physician only requirement. 
physician-only requirement was specifically upheld in Casey, so that only a physician can perform an abortion, and that was upheld in Casey. So there's no question that that in itself was not an undue burden. However, what the plaintiffs argued was that it was invalid because of its purpose. Essentially, they argued that the state of Montana was trying to place an obstacle to women seeking abortions. And listen to what the U.S. Supreme Court said. The U.S. Supreme Court said, even assuming the correctness of the premise that a legislative purpose to interfere with the constitutionally protected right to abortion without the effect of interfering with that right, even assuming that, in this case, uh, in this case, there would there it, it wouldn't there was no evidence. Essentially, there was no evidence in this case that the state was doing it for that reason. But the the important thing is the court didn't even grant that premise. Essentially, the court was saying that we're not even going to admit, we're not even going to concede that if the state is passing a regulation for the purpose of trying to decrease abortions or for the purpose of trying to to limit the right of abortion, we're still not going to strike down the law unless there is an undue burden. Now that, of course, is important to our case, because in our case, the motive of the state is an issue. If the motive of the state is not an issue, then the only thing that you have to look at is, is the Texas regulation an undue burden? Whereas some of the justices' questions, as you saw before, asked about the state's reason for passing the regulation in the first place. Now, of course, I hasten to point out that just because the Supreme Court decided one way then doesn't mean the Supreme Court can't change its mind now, but the precedent at least seems to be that courts don't really look that heavily on the evidence of what the intention of the state might have been. The next case comes from the Fifth Circuit, Texas Medical Providers versus Lakey. This was based on a Texas statute that got a lot of political play at the time, I remember, that prohibited a woman from getting an abortion unless the doctor, who will also provide the abortion, performs an ultrasound on the woman and takes steps to show that the ultrasound images to the woman, basically she, they, they literally had, she had to open her eyes and stare at the images of the unborn baby. It was a whole uh, set of ruling, ruling like that, of rules like that. And that was upheld as well at least by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. It didn't get to the U.S. Supreme Court. It just was the Court of Appeals, but it was upheld. Now, this is fairly similar to the law, the case between the Supreme Court now, even though the case now is more about the regulations of the clinics and the, and the, and the doctors. But in both cases, we're talking about a Texas statute that was really probably designed to limit the ability of abortion, and that was upheld by the Seventh Circuit. And finally, I want to look at another circuit case, Women's Medical Professional Corp versus Baird, where you had the issue of targeting abortion clinics. In other words, what if there's a law that specifically targets abortion clinics for harsh treatment, which is, of course, what one of the allegations are in our case. One of certainly we saw Justice Ginsburg's quotes before, and the allegation being that Texas isn't worried as much about colonoscopies, they're worried more about abortions, even though there's less of a risk. Well, that was kind of the exact issue that, w that came before the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in the Baird case. In that case, under Ohio law, the clinic was required to be licensed and it needed to enter into a written transfer agreement with a hospital to meet the licensing requirement, but the hospitals in the area would not enter into an agreement with the clinic. They sought a waiver, the waiver was denied, and therefore they were going to be forced to shut down. And the Sixth Circuit analyzed this as it's required to under Casey, under this idea of undue burden. And the court said that a finding of undue burden is shorthand for the conclusion that the state regulation has the purpose, notice that word purpose there, or effect, of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of women seeking an abortion of a non-viable fetus. The government had essentially argued something very similar to what Texas is doing over here. The government of Ohio argued that this is merely an as-applied challenge to a neutral regulation of general applicability. This wasn't specifically this this idea, this uh, requirement that there be transfer uh, that there be transfer agreements with local hospitals wasn't specifically geared towards abortion. It would really meant it was for everybody. But of course, the plaintiffs argued that this the intent was to target abortion clinics specifically. And the court didn't even bother with all that. The only thing the court made a determination is, is this an undue burden? And the court said the central issue in this case, we're not going to worry about motives, we're not going to worry about those other things, we're just going to worry about whether closing of an abortion clinic, requiring approximately 3,000 patients per year to go somewhere else, constitutes an undue burden, and the court said no.
we conclude that while the closing of the Dayton Clinic may be burdensome for some of its potential patients, the fact that these women may have to travel farther to obtain an abortion does not constitute a substantial obstacle. So interestingly enough, we've seen five cases now. We've seen Baird, we've seen um, Lakey, we've seen Masaryk versus Armstrong, Eastside Women's Clinic, Gonzalez versus Carhartt. Every single one of them refused to strike down a state statute or federal statute that limited access to abortion. Whether we're talking about motives of state, uh, whether we're talking about burdens, procedures, they all came to the same conclusion that the idea of an undue burden, the fact that a regulation has an un places an undue burden is a very high hurdle to establish. If you look at the, if you just look at the precedent, then the indication probably would be that the Texas Texas uh, legislation has a pretty good chance to stand, just based on the fact that it's been so hard to get one of these abortion statutes to be struck down. Of course, in this case, you've got the, really, there's no other way to say it than the Kennedy issue. Justice Kennedy is really the swing vote over here and the person that's going to decide how this case goes one way or the other. And Justice Kennedy, when it comes to this sort of thing, has usually been in favor of the right to abortion. Although it should be noted that Justice Kennedy did cast the deciding vote in Gonzalez versus Carhartt to uphold the partial birth abortion ban. So it's kind of unpredictable about what Justice Kennedy is going to do. In recent years, Justice Kennedy has cast the deciding vote in favor of the quote-unquote liberal side of the courts when it, came, when it came to, for example, same-sex marriage and a few other issues. So it'll be fascinating to see what Justice Kennedy does in this case. But if the Texas abortion statute is struck down, it will be kind of a precedent shattering move. It'll be the first time in a long time that the undue burden test was used to strike down a regulation that limits abortion. I hope you've enjoyed this analysis. Thank you very much for watching. Appreciate your ability to get all the way to the end. Uh, for, for the National Paralegal College Faculty's Legal Analysis of the News, this is Stephen Haas. Have a fantastic day, everybody.